Welcome everybody, welcome to another exciting edition of Cascading Climate Action's Climate Science on Tap. You guys excited for some climate science? I understand that it's raining, it's a little cold, but I want to hear a little bit more enthusiasm than that. Are you ready for some climate science? Are you ready to hear about trees? Yes, of course you are, of course you are. Well, it's kind of hard to imagine on this rainy November evening that just a few short months ago, we were experiencing the most extreme heat wave that we have experienced in this region. And that got us to thinking about the importance of uh, dealing with the heat. And so that's why we sort of came up with this idea for the climate science on tap that we're experiencing today. Over the last few weeks, you've been hearing a lot about international climate agreements, COP26, right? Well, tonight we're going to talk a little bit more about what we can do locally to deal with some of the more extreme uh, aspects or impacts of climate change, most notably heat. Uh, so y'all remember, of course, roads buckling, the economy took a hit during this, the heat wave of the summer, and of course, most uh, you know, worrisome was that 1,200 people lost their lives because of that heat wave. What we're going to be talking about today is the role of heat locally in our urban environment, but also the role that trees can play to help us adapt in some ways, to mitigate climate change in other ways. Uh, and at the same time, the impact that warming temperatures and climate change will have on our urban forests. So we have a little bit of, of something for everyone tonight, and hopefully through this experience, you'll learn what you can do to uh, take action on behalf of the planet. So as I said, my name is Sean McDonald. I am a faculty member in the Program on the Environment at the University of Washington, and I'll be your moderator this evening. We've got a great lineup of speakers, and I just want to go ahead and give them a shout out, and please clap uproariously when you hear their names. We've got arborist Ali Lakehart of Trees of Seattle, Trees for Seattle. Great. We have Laura Whiteley Bender, a program manager for King County Climate Preparedness. Let's give it for her. And last but certainly not least, WSU postdoctoral researcher and director of Forest Health Watch, Dr. Joey Hulbert. So let's hear it for him as well. As I said, this is an event brought to you by Cascadia Climate Action, the operative word being action. We're going to talk to you a lot tonight about things that you all can do on behalf of the climate. I encourage you to check out Cascadia Climate Action's website. I also encourage you to talk to some of our tablers over here on the left. We've got Forterra Northwest and Green Seattle Partnership. Let's hear it for them. Wave your hands, y'all. We've got Tree Pack. That's a political action committee for, the, for a cause, not a candidate. Let's hear it for them. Don't Clear Cut Seattle. Let's hear it for them. Plant Amnesty, let's hear it for them as well. Seattle Green Spaces Coalition. And of course, Cascadia Climate Action, you can go see them right over there at that table. I do want to mention, of course, the elephant in the room, and that is COVID. We encourage everyone to follow COVID safety guidelines. If you would like to wear your mask, we encourage that. We encourage social distancing where you can do that as well. And of course, wash your hands. I was just in the restroom. You definitely want to wash your hands. Please do that as well. Tonight, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. And there's two separate ways that you can provide questions for our panelists. First, the old-fashioned way, there are some yellow cards distributed around the tables. If at any point you have a question for our panelists, write your questions down on the cards and at a given moment, the volunteers will be circulating around to pick these up before we launch into our Q&A. The second way, the more technologically savvy way, is to use your smartphone and shoot a picture of this QR code or go to Slido and enter in that code right there. I see people scrambling for their phones, that's good. And uh, please go ahead and enter your questions in Slido or uh, go, ahead and print the, uh, uh, go ahead and print them on the cards, and we'll go ahead and collect those later. But there will be a chance for Q&A. So without further ado, I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to invite our first speaker up to the stage. Our first speaker, Laura 
Bradley Biner is the Climate Preparedness Program Manager for King County. In this role, Laura is responsible for working with King County agencies to prepare for the impacts of climate change and strengthening regional partnerships to address shared challenges and opportunities around climate preparedness. Prior to joining King County in 2017, Laura worked across the hall for me extensively with local, state, and tribal governments in the Pacific Northwest on climate adaptation as a senior strategist for the University of Washington's Climate Impacts Group. So with, without further ado, let's give it up for Laura. Yeah, I don't want to see anything. Okay, there we go. Hi. Um, sorry, Sean. Now I can see you all. And Allie and I were saying, oh my god, look at all these people. I am excited to see all of you. I, this is the first presentation I've given that's in three dimensions in like a year and a half. So I'm, I'm not sure what to do with myself. I feel like I need to like, are you real? Right? Um, so thank you for coming out and watching me completely fumble my way through a brand new slide deck and presentation in 3D. Uh, so I want to talk to you today about how King County is working to address heat. And we're doing that with the city of Seattle and other partners. And trees are a huge part of that. But what I want to relate to you today is that trees are part of that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But I also want to recognize that I'm competing with beer. And I know that the beer may win in some context. So if this is the one thing that you remember from my presentation, it's these three key messages. Heat matters, where you live matters, and we need a comprehensive approach to dealing with heat. So there you go, you can go back to your beer. Uh, all right, I've structured the talk around these three points, so off we go. Key point well, number one, heat matters. So. First of all, who's vulnerable to heat? I think the first thing that we tend to think about are seniors, and that's often where we stop thinking about it. It's like, oh, it's just an issue for seniors. And the reality is that heat affects everybody, and it's sometimes surprising how many people and how many different types of groups are affected by heat. So children are vulnerable to heat, because they often just don't recognize the signs of heat illness. They're out there playing, doing their thing. If people who are pregnant are vulnerable to heat, People who take certain medications, uh, either you know, if antidepressants or cardiac medications, other types of medications that can affect the body's ability to regulate heat. Also, uh, people who work outdoors, of course, uh, are affected by heat. And then the, I don't want to forget our houseless population. And that is actually a population that really, really bore a lot of the, the, the stress and the injury from our heat wave uh, back in June. So the other thing to know is that it's, it's really, you know, across this wide range of ages, so all of us at any given point can be affected by the heat wave. So don't think of it just as a problem for seniors. So in the Puget Sound region, we're not really known for heat, right? This is what we're known for. Gray, check, rain, check, heat, not so much, right? And I'm not, you know, and that's understandable. Our summers, Let's be frank, our summers are typically pretty perfect. Um, don't tell anybody else, right? We'll just keep that to ourselves. Um, and so, you know, heat just isn't something that communities have really thought that they need to prepare for in any significant way. And that, unfortunately, needs to change, and it is changing. I mean, even before the heat dome incident this summer, conversations around how to deal with heat were starting to pick up, but the heat dome really shifted that conversation. So now, it's not a question of, you know, the, the old mantra used to be, we don't have to worry about heat. Now the, the understanding is, yes, we do. And it didn't get any more real than the deaths that we had this summer from, from heat. And we know that climate change is exacerbating this issue, so this problem is not going to go away. This is a figure uh, just showing some of the projected warming in our region from the Integrated Scenarios Project. The main thing to note is that with rising greenhouse gas emissions, we're projecting warming across all seasons with, most, uh, with the largest amount of warming in the summer. Some of the high emission scenarios show that by the 2080s, our average summer temperature could be 5 to 13 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. That's hot. 
All right, second major point, where you live matters. This is particularly true in the context of the urban heat island effect. So urban areas and to a lesser degree suburban areas have a lot of hard surfaces, pavement, buildings, et cetera, that heat up during the course of the day. They hold on to that heat longer than say plants and green spaces do. So they release that heat more slowly into the evening hours as temperatures go down. And as a result, those areas stay hotter longer. Other types of activities that can drive up heat include, uh, and that are pre predominantly in urban areas, are industrial activities and transportation. So it's not just those building services, it's also what we're doing in those spaces that can add to that urban heat. So in 2020, um, there were some good things that came out of 2020, and one of them is a project that King County did with the City of Seattle and Seattle Public Utilities and other partners to map heat in the King County metro area. We were interested in understanding how differences in land use and land temperature can affect temperature, the local temperature that we experience when we walk out the door. In effect, we wanted to get a better understanding of where our urban heat island is. So we embarked on this project. And with the help of 17 amazing volunteers, we conducted a one-day data collection. It was July 27th, 2020. The volunteers drove 15 predetermined routes and three different times of the day, 6 to 7 a.m., 3 to 4 p.m., and 7 to 8 p.m., with equipment mounted on their cars, collected over 110,000 measurements. And what we got out of that was very clearly, uh, we got some fantastic maps, which I'm going to show you in a moment, but the punchline is that what we discovered is that you could take somebody and drop them in two different places at the county at the same time, and that person could experience up to a 23 degree temperature difference. So what did we get? So I, a little bit of the resolution's not so great here, but we got three maps that show us how temperatures vary in the area uh, over the course, or depending on land use and land cover, and, and, and some of this is geography, it's a large area. So this is the results showing for the 6 to 7 a.m. drive time. You can see those blue areas are essentially East King County, more forested areas. The red areas are more urbanized areas. So even at 6 in the morning, we're seeing that our more urbanized areas are holding on to that heat, and they're starting out the day hotter. Midday, so th this was a day when the temperature was 94 degrees. Midday, it's getting hot everywhere, and that's understandable. Uh, but by evening, already those less urbanized areas with more tree cover, more green space, they're letting go of that heat faster, and our urbanized areas are holding on to it. So it really, I mean, you know, we knew that we have the heat, urban heat island effect. You can experience that just walking out your door, right? There's a reason why people go to the parks when it's hot, because it's cooler in the parks. But this really helped us visualize what our urban heat island looked like, and it really helped us understand how significant that temperature difference was between East and West King County. You know, the heat maps, though, really helped to underscore that even though it's hot, it, you know, everyone's affected by heat, it clearly showed that not everybody is affected equally. And I think it's important to recognize that some of the hottest areas in the county from that heat mapping work are also areas that already experience uh, disproportionate impacts or, or inequalities, excuse me, around housing, income, chronic disease, and other factors that can leave communities more vulnerable to climate change and to heat events in particular. And the reality is that a lot of these inequalities are borne by communities of color. So when we talk about heat, heat impacts and addressing heat impacts, it is absolutely an equity issue in terms of, of who's affected and, and where those folks live. I also want to acknowledge the impact of redlining, and this comes back to our trees. So discriminatory housing practices and systemic racism essentially created some of these spatial inequities and, and the housing inequities and the income and the access to healthcare inequities that we talked about earlier. It affected that ability to build intergenerational wealth. That systemic racism and the redlining led to systematic disinvestment in communities. So in those communities, you don't see the big tree canopy. 
that some of our older areas of Seattle and some of the areas in North Seattle really have. So you can see this, this red line, the effect of the redlining and the effect of that disinvestment sometimes just in our trees. I think Ali will be able to touch on that more. All right, so I want to close with my final message, which is that comprehensive planning matters. This is not an example of comprehensive planning, just to be clear. Okay, this was actually in the Seattle Times from the heat wave, so this was apparently some, one person's approach to staying cool. All right, I know this is going to be hard to see. That says urban greening. Urban greening is absolutely an essential part of how we deal with heat and urban environments. But it is one component of a multifaceted problem that needs a multifaceted solution set. We need to be looking at all of these different issues if we're really going to effectively address heat over the long term. So in 2020, King County released its Strategic Climate Action Plan. We have a, we have, this was the update to our 2015 plan. And at that point in time, we already knew that we wanted to tackle this heat question. So we committed in that plan to develop an urban heat mitigation strategy in partnership with the city of Seattle and our other King County jurisdictions and our frontline communities who are living in those areas that are most affected by heat. And this is work that we're fortunate to get some FEMA funding to, uh, to, to, to help support the work. So we're going to start on this in 22 and have that strategy developed in 22. And I'm not going to get into kind of what the vision is of that plan, but I just want to note that we're really looking at this as a two kind of major areas of work. First, we need to strengthen our short-term response and our coping mechanisms. So that's your emergency health messaging, your alerts, uh, your cooling centers, but also looking at ways to help people stay cool within their homes. It's looking at our emergency medical services. Our healthcare system was overwhelmed by this heat wave. And so there are things that we need to be looking at even within that system to help ensure that we're prepared for the next heat wave. And it's also looking at things like access to spray parks or, or other ways that, that kids and communities can stay cool in that short term. But just as importantly, and perhaps more importantly, we need to adapt our built environment to, to address heat, to be ready for heat. So that means looking at changes in building codes, right? Can we develop more incentive programs for green roofs, white roofs, increased energy efficiency? People are going to get air conditioning, people who can afford it, right? That's only going to exacerbate our equity issues. Those who can afford it will get the air conditioning. Those who can't afford it won't. That just widens that gap. But when we, where we are using air conditioning, our, our energy efficiency and our building codes can help ensure that those units are working as efficiently as possible and that cold air isn't just headed right out the window. Um, it's also looking at how we design neighborhoods and communities. Uh, this picture down here at the bottom right, that is from an affordable housing project in Renton, Willowcrest Homes. They developed the affordable housing with a whole campus that has access, that has open space, green space, trees. We can do this, right? We can develop our communities in a way that give us that, that opportunity to create shade and places to get out of the heat even as we are developing and increasing density. So that's the big picture. The rest of this time we're going to talk about trees because I do want to just again reiterate trees are critical. Trees are a critical part of this uh, and the county has actually got a three million trees initiative where we're working on planting, restoring and um, oh, I knew I was going to forget the third R. Uh, we're, with uh, restoring, planting, we're doing good stuff with three million trees. That's what. <laughs> so, all right. So I'm going to hand it over to Allie now. Um, yeah, maybe Sean. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to hand it over to Allie. So. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, I really appreciate it. So just as a reminder, y'all. Um, if you have questions for Laura, that was a really interesting presentation. I'm sure everyone here has questions about the work that she's doing, the work that King County is doing. You can go ahead and start filling out those cards now or add your questions there um, using Slido, the, the QR code, just follow that link there on your smartphone. Our next presenter in the lineup, since we are moving from talking about heat and sort of the comprehensive ideas around how we deal with heat to that idea of urban greening and the importance of trees. 
um, and moving more directly towards trees now. Our next speaker is really going to speak to that. Allie Lakehart has dedicated their career to the connection between plants and people. A former environmental educator and National Park Service pork, park ranger, they have master's degrees in environmental management with a focus on centering equity in public land decision making. Allie authored three municipal urban forest enhancement plans in South King County and has planted thousands of trees and plants with volunteers. I like the emphasis on thousands. And removed a ton of, I'm not sure if ton is the, maybe a ton, more than a ton, possibly multiple tons of invasive species over the years. Allie is an ISA certified arborist and has also helped draft municipal private land tree policy recommendations with the Bullet Foundation. Unsurprisingly, they love trees and spending time outside, especially backpacking and time on the water. Allie is working on building personal resilience and hope in the face of a changing climate and believes centering the most impacted through community connection, collaboration, and care is vital in adapting and mitigating its effects. So let's go ahead and give it up for Allie Lakehart. Good evening, everyone. It's so wonderful to be with you all, and um, I'm just impressed that uh, I love what, I just love when Seattle shows up and it's like cold and rainy. It's just always very like fun to me. Um, but my name is Allie, and I am so humbled and honored to get to lead in an awesome team um, for the city of Seattle called Trees for Seattle. Um, and Trees for Seattle is really it's all about Trees, ha, ha, ha. Bet you couldn't guess that one. Um, but we are, you know, our goal is to inclusively, inclusively engage you, you, and empower you, residents of Seattle, in planning and caring for the urban forest. And in case, I know you're here to learn about the urban forest, so you probably know a little bit about it, but I do have some slides that can do some defining for us. Um, but we also plant trees, a thousand trees every year, um, with residents like you in your yards and in your places of worship and um, in your, your schools, um, businesses as well. And then we're just some kind of dorky arborists who you can email with questions. That's real. If you've, some of you probably have met Lou over the years. He and I work together. We answer your questions. You can send us pictures. Um, and then we also offer pruning classes and all sorts of tree-related engagement and education. We have a fantastic app called the Seattle, it's called tree, Seattle Tree Walks, um, but yes, it's one of my two truths and a lie. I have helped write an app. Um, never thought that would be me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yep, so um, you can find that on wherever you find your apps. Um, but we are here to just get people excited, engaged, and interested in these beautiful beings that we live around every day. Because right now, you are in a forest. I think that, you know, we often forget that this place was a forest, but also that it still is. And so, in case you don't think of Seattle's forest this way, Hopefully you were celebrating Seattle Forest Week last week, but the, you know, an urban forest, every city has one. And we do like to talk about it as one forest, although of course that stretches regionally, Shoreline, Renton, right? Like all of these neighboring cities, the trees don't know that they're in different places. Um, but urban forests are the trees in your yard, the trees on your street, the trees at your bus stop. If you are at UW, they're the trees on your campus. Um, you know, exactly where we plant trees with Trees for Seattle, that is the urban forest. And of course, we're the Emerald City, right? We think of ourselves that way. Um, but I think that oftentimes we, we don't see trees in that light. We see them as individuals, um, but they are communicating with each other and they are part of a forest and they are relied on by birds and bees and you know, all sorts of other beings that share this city with us. And, you know, the urban forest is incredibly important. Um, I think a lot of us think of clean air. A conifer can remove 50, part of, 50, sorry, 50 pounds of particles from the air um, per year. Just one large conifer. 
Um, and we think a lot about ecosystem services. Um, if you don't know the cool relationship between, between trees and salmon, I'd be happy to talk about it <laughs> at length with you. Um, but there are lots of, of things that we think about, and of course we think of shade, um, but do you think of mood disorder treatment? Every 1% increase in a city's urban canopy results in a 4% decrease in the treatment of mental health issues in that city, and that's adjusting for socioeconomic impacts. So, you know, we don't think about all of the benefits that trees are providing to us every day, but they are absolutely caring for you. Um, and so it's incredible to think about, you know, our relationship and the reciprocity um, when we care for them. Um, and so in case you are feeling stressed, if you were like me and getting here tonight was a little bit of a challenge, 20 minutes in nature can significantly reduce your cortisol and, all, and other stress hormones. And yes, they have absolutely checked and urban green spaces do count. It's slightly better outcomes if you're gonna make it to, you know, Mount Rainier National Park or something like that, but you absolutely can get the benefits just from um, your neighborhood park. And it doesn't even have to be like a Seward or a Magnuson or someone, one of our great, you know, discovery park. So um, there's many, many benefits to, to our urban forest. Sometimes you hear us talk a lot about canopy cover and, you know, what is canopy? canopy cover when we're talking about it. So imagine that you are a bird flying over Seattle and you're looking down at the city. The percentage of the ground in the summer, not right now, the percentage of the ground in the summer that's obscured by a tree, leaves, branches, uh, that is the canopy cover. And so in 2016, I actually just got an email about this today. We are updating our canopy numbers ASAP. We'll, um, we're Ask, they're looking at, they're looking at into what we want to ask, basically, from our statisticians and from our, uh, the people who analyze LIDAR. But we know in 2016, we had 28% canopy cover in this city, so over the entire city. But of course, we know that that's not true in all neighborhoods, right? And so that is across Seattle, the entire city had a 28% canopy cover. So when you think of Seattle's forest, I wonder what you're picturing in your mind. Because when I came to this place, this was what I pictured. This is where I wanted to, to say, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, I'm a transplant from the South. You can't hear it in my voice. Um, but I was blown away the first time I went to Lincoln Park. And I was incredibly bowled over the first time I saw old growth at Seward and I knew that I wanted to live here. That's really real stories there. <laughs> um, and so when I think about Seattle's forest, that's what I think about. And it makes sense. I mean, I hope, since you're all here, that this is really beautiful to you. But this isn't where Seattle's forest is. Not at all. 72% of Seattle's forest is where we live. So it's on single family and multifamily residential homes. That's yards are where Seattle's forest is. 11% of Seattle's forest is in parks. It's super substantial, right? But when you think about all of the beautiful parks that we have, and that's only 11% of our canopy, um, it makes you kind of like realize that you and I, if you're a renter, if you, if you own your home, you and I, we are the managers. And I know I literally am, but I mean Allie, like the Allie who goes home and like has a dog and like, we are the managers of the urban forest. We really are. We make decisions every day that impact the trees where we live, you know, where we, we play, where we, um, some of us, maybe where you eat, sometimes the businesses that you frequent. Um, and, you know, I think that that's really important to kind of understand is that we have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of connection and reciprocity, but we also have a lot of responsibility for trees um, as residents. And this is true, by the way, I worked in South King County a lot, so if you don't, I know a lot, most of us are probably from Seattle. I don't know a ton about Shoreline, but I'm assuming that, that they're true as well. Um, this is very true for Fury and SeaTac, Des Moines. Um, residents, you know, generally have a, most of the tree canopy um, in, in all, all of the cities that I've worked with. 
Um, and the other kind of interesting thing is 72% of our canopy is deciduous, so it means it's not an evergreen tree. It's not going to keep its leaves all winter long. And the, but 60, almost 60% of conifers are on, on residential single family and multifamily land. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's important. Conifers, uh, they do keep their leaves year round, so they're providing benefits in that way year round. Also, our large conifers tend to be, they love to soak up water, which is important in, where I work. I work a lot with SPU. I actually work with all departments in the city who touch urban forestry. There are 14 of them. Um, but I uh, work primarily with SPU, and that's kind of where, where we're housed is because we are you know, really thinking about cleaning stormwater, another benefit of the urban forest. Um, and hopefully um, slowing it down before it gets to our urban creeks and before it gets to the sound. Oh, that one didn't turn out so well, sorry. Um, and then, you know, um, we can think about, and I would love to talk if anyone has any questions, there are differences in, in choices, like if you have a, a north side that you want to shade in the summer of your house and you want to plant a tree, sure, deciduous trees are fantastic but they, their leaf complexity can be quite different. Actually, Joey will talk a little bit more about Western Red Cedar, but I always think of that tree. I don't know if anyone has a personal relationship with Western Red Cedar, I do. Um, and they have a very like interesting and complex needle or leaf. Their sprays have lots of little grooves in them, and that's really helpful to slow down stormwater, a lot of surface area to really literally move through um, the tree, but also it's fantastic for air filtration. And so if you live under a flight path, um, some of our conifers, you know, they have those, that buffer from the flight path year round. And certain trees like, um, they're not true cedars, but like our Western red cedar and other cedars, they have this like really incredible leaf complexity and particulates get trapped in their needles and they actually make the air cleaner. By the way, I'm also a huge fan of deciduous trees, just to be clear, but you know, in general, we are trying to encourage people to plant the right tree for the right place. They get really big. This is a, anybody know that one? It's Coastal Redwoods, giant. <laughs> you probably can't fit it in your yard. Um, but um, you know, it is right tree, right place for sure, but we do encourage people who have the room to plant conifers. Um, and so this is just a cool graphic from King County that I just loved. And it was like all the things, right, that, that are happening that we predict to happen with climate um, changes. And, you know, for, for us at Trees for Seattle, we're really focused on that left-hand side in the upper corner, right, looking at increased heat and looking at public health impacts due to heat. So how can we get people shade? How can we get people shade? And so Laura told you about this awesome study. I just want to point out that Anne, who is here, uh, reminded me the other day in a presentation that actually Seattle had a very similar disparity. It was not quite 23 degrees, I think it was closer to just a little less than 20 degrees, but if you were in one neighborhood of Seattle and you lived in another neighborhood of Seattle, your neighborhood might be 20 degrees hotter than another on that, on that afternoon. And so, um, what do we know though? What we know is that urban heat islands are the inverse, they're the opposite of canopy maps. So the left-hand side is our canopy map, and you can see, you know, I, I personally, I see Discovery Park, I see Seward Park, and then I see those places lighting up as cooler on the right-hand side. Um, and so we weren't surprised by any of the urban heat information. I think we knew because we have our canopy data, but it just absolutely confirmed it for us, um, and also gave us priority neighborhoods and areas that we really want to focus on. Of course, we know that these areas have been historically underinvested in. Um, they are communities of color often. Uh, there is, this is actually a, it's not an urban heat map. It looks similar, but that's actually our race and social just, like, sorry, race and social equity composite index. So this is all socio-demographics on this side over here. And it actually, it, it looks similar um, where the, the red, the dark red are areas where we have, um, you know, people who speak uh, English as a second language or do not speak English, um, who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, sorry, these are hard to read, um, and then as well health disadvantaged. And so they look very similar to urban heat mapping. But the other thing I think is interesting, and this is gonna push this over to Joey, um, there's also an interesting thing here where we have high heat neighborhoods that have socioeconomic disadvantages, 
that also have an abundance of street trees susceptible to pests of concern. So these are pests that we expect to see in Seattle because of climate change. So all of these things point to certain areas of the city where our team needs to be doing you know, reparative work and really to be investing sometimes for the first time in some ways um, in some of the canopy in these neighborhoods. And so, you know, looking at Lake City, Pinehurst, you're looking at, you know, South Park, Georgetown, um, sometimes the CD, you know, all of these areas. But this is also a map that we've been trying to make some decisions on as well. Like, where do we think we're gonna lose trees? And, you know, I'm gonna skip this one because I think we know some of the reasons that we've gotten here. Thank you to Laura. I also just wanna point out, like, compaction like the, the soil not being healthy. I want to point out the fact that we're looking at trees that are living in areas where it's hotter. They're also experiencing heat impacts, right? It's not just us that are having a hard time with heat dome. And so some of you might have planted some trees this year who didn't make it through heat dome. Um, but we, we definitely saw that in our program. And we saw that in certain places, these high heat areas more than other places in Seattle. More trees, it's cooler. That's what the left-hand side says. And then, you know, less impervious surface and a 40% canopy in neighborhoods. It is, this is like globally kind of thought of as the greatest potential for climate mitigation um, and an urban, for urban re residents. Like that is kind of a, a global goal. It's not our city's goal, I'll be really honest, um, but it's, it's just an interesting, um, I can tell you where this came from, but it's um, climate, it, it, it's a, it, anyway, there we are. So these are, these, are, these are ways to keep areas where people live coolest. Um, I think we're gonna have a question about this later, but I just wanna point out that when we talk about what we're planting, we're thinking about where we're planting. Your yard is not a native environment. It doesn't fit like a forest. So we do wanna think about that. There are often places where it doesn't make sense to put a vine maple, even though it's a beautiful native species. Um, I want to always ask people why they are planting that tree. Is it a cultural connection? Is it something that they remember from their childhood? Do they want food? You know, what is it that they want that tree to do and be for them? Um, what kind of relationship do they want to have? Uh, I always want to ask people, when are you planting for? Um, there are a few of us scientists, and I don't know if anyone else is, uh, in here today, but who work uh, in a group called the Forest Adaptation Network. And we've been talking about how we're going to deal with, um, with native trees and where we're selecting seed and making sure that we are planting 100, 150, 200 years in the future. Um, and there, is, there are a lot of feelings about that. And it's a little bit challenging because the science cannot keep up with how quickly this climate is changing. And so there's a lot of, of trials that are happening um, kind of in real time. And it's more of a management than often it's research. And I don't, know, I don't know if Joey will address that at all, but it's kind of interesting. We do encourage people to please avoid invasive trees. I'd be happy to tell you what some of those are, but you could also just check out King County's website. Um, there's a great, we have a great program. Um, and then also reminding people that Sometimes, you know, we hear a lot about native trees. I personally love them. I have a lot in my yard. And also, non-native species can tolerate tough urban environments, like a street tree um, that's parked, you know, that's literally in a, like a parking strip. Um, and then also, we can often find a tree that fits into small spaces. And so, you know, there are oftentimes people who have patios that they want a tree for or, you know, other places. And so we do often encourage people to, you know, to think broadly when they're looking for a tree. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to kind of end with that tree health in Seattle is honestly relatively understudied. Um, certain departments, we are studying the, the tree health, including our street trees, but 72% of canopy is just in our yards. And so we don't have a lot of data about private trees. We don't know if they're healthy, if they're not healthy. And so um, I think, Joey's going to talk to us about that. <laughs> um, but I also want to just mention that the Green Seattle Partnership is here. They do run, I'm sure there are some forest stewards here. Anybody want to shout out their forest steward? Oh, I love to hear it. All right. So <laughs> there are people who are, you know, out there all the time. They're caring for trees in our, 
and our forested parks and our natural areas. Um, I run <laughs> tree care events as well, so keep an eye out for Trees for Seattle. Um, and then don't forget to care for the trees where you live. And so that might be like a kind word. It might just be like getting to know what the heck that thing is that you live with. Maybe you could water it when it's hot outside. Maybe you could go get some mulch and put a ring around it. I'll teach you how to do it if you want to know. It's on the website. Um, you know, and then, and then you can just go from there, right? Like then you can start getting really excited about trees and maybe starting to learn some pruning and other things. Um, but caring for trees where you live is, is part of the help as well. If you have questions, it's seattle.gov slash trees. There's lots of information. Also, this is how you can contact me. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Ali. That was fantastic. We learned a lot about trees in Seattle. So, and that's actually a great uh, transition. The last thing that Ali was talking about was, of course, what we know about trees, uh, scientific research on trees in our area, the health of our trees in our area. And so uh, that's a fantastic transition to the last speaker in our series, uh, Dr. Joey Hulbert. He's a U.S. Department of Agriculture NIFA postdoctoral research fellow based at the Washington State University Research and Extension Center in Puyallup, Washington. He's also the director of the Forest Health Watch program, where he draws on his extensive experience leading the Cape Citizen Science Program during his doctoral degree at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Through this experience, his background in forest health, and his passion for public engagement in science, Dr. Hulbert engages communities in research about the consequences of climate change on the health of forests. He is eager, oh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, he, uh, he's eager to cultivate more partnerships and give back to communities to feel free, so feel free to contact him to collaborate or organize a forest health presentation for your community. Before I uh, turn it over to him, I do want to just make one more plug. If you have questions for any of our speakers, go to Slido. You can either type in the code 568403, or you can scan the QR code to ask your questions of our speakers. And so without further ado, I do want to turn it over to Dr. Joey Holbert. Let's go ahead and give it up for Dr. Joey Hilbert. All right, thank you. It has always been my dream to be at an event like this. If we combine science and beer, then you all are exactly the people I want to speak to, and I want to know all of you. So please, please reach out to me. Come and talk to me. I'd love to understand your perspectives, and your perspectives are really important. So I can't thank the previous speakers enough. Thank you, Ali and Laura. Set us up really well. We're talking about some actions that you can do to help our urban forests in Seattle and, 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 and um, beyond. I do want to start by acknowledging that we are really privileged right now to be here on um, the Coast Salish people's lands. And, and we acknowledge that we're here on stolen land from many different communities. And I encourage you to check out nativeland.ca to see all the different um, native peoples and all the, the communities that have occupied this part of Seattle in the past. But yeah, I just want to acknowledge that we are really privileged to get to learn and, and explore and study in this area. As Ali said, she moved here from, from the south because of what we have, and we're just really lucky to have it. I'm going to start, I'm going to introduce our program because I really think it's important that you all know we exist and that we're there as a resource to you all. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about our program at WSU in Puyallup. And then I'm going to talk about some of the factors that are affecting the health of trees in our urban community. And then we'll talk about some actual local concerns we have before I introduce the Forest Health Watch program and how you all can get involved in helping keep our forests healthy. I do want to acknowledge, as Sean mentioned, I am here today because I'm supported by tax money, tax dollars. Thank you all very much for contributing to the USDA. They've given me a fellowship so that I can be here with you all and, and lead this really cool work. So thank you. Um, if you aren't aware, there's a research and extension center that's part of Washington State University just east of Tacoma. And so we 
Uh, I spend a lot of my time working and learning on the traditional homelands of the Puyallup tribe of Indians, actually. But today I'm here with you in the beautiful Seattle Ballard area. This is the, a lot of my mentors in Puyallup, and I just wanted to introduce them because we're really team forest health, if you will. So all these people have expertise in keeping trees healthy, and we're totally there as a resource to you all. We study things like um, the diseases that are spread with the ornamental plants that you may purchase or buy um, or, or plant. We study things like how do we keep madrones healthy. You may have seen madrone blight and some of the, the diseases that affect madrone. We're interested in studying are there genetic, can we use genetic diversity as a tool to combat things like that and how can we use genetic diversity as a tool to adapt to future climates. And so we have a common garden with madrones. We're also studying a disease on maples now called sooty bark disease. And I'm going to introduce that a little bit more. But I really welcome you all to reach out to us if we could be of any help or answer any questions about the trees in your yard or the trees in your communities. I will say that if you love Pacific madrone or if you love Arbutus menziesii, or uh, maybe you call it Madrona, maybe you call it Arbutus. If you love Pacific Madrona like we do, and there's some phenomenal berry crop out right now, but I encourage you to study or to join this Arbutus army. So it's another community group with all things interesting about Pacific Madrona. And so we call it army for the shorthand of Arbutus menziesii. But in all things, again, just emphasizing that we're here as a resource, and you're welcome to contact me. I'll share my details at the end. So I'm just briefly going to talk about the factors that affect tree health. And you can conceptualize this pretty simply with a triangle. Sometimes we refer to this as the disease triangle. Um, but in some cases, we might be talking about insect pests that may be um, causing infecting or infesting a tree, if you will, rather than a disease. So there's three components of this. There's, there's the introduction of a pest or pathogen. There's the host, so in this case a tree, and there's the environment. And all three of these things have to interact in a certain way to create this disease or this unhealthy tree. So first let's talk about some pest or pathogens. In Seattle, we are uniquely challenged because we are a major port of entry. We have lots of different pathways that a new organism can arrive in Seattle. And one of them is our major port. And so we are constantly concerned and looking out for many insect pests and the arrival of other stuff that we don't even know. So if you see something that concerns you, we encourage you to let us know so we can investigate it. Emerald ash borer is a really, um, is a great example of an invasive insect. It hasn't moved further west than Colorado yet, but we anticipate it will arrive, and we know Oregon ash, our local ash, is susceptible to it. So we are quite concerned. Keep your eye out. Spotted lanternfly is another example of a pest that can affect the tree health, another one that the Washington Sp Invasive Species Council is readily out there looking for. Um, you know, if you see this really charismatic insect, please report it. Longhorn beetles, there's numerous longhorn beetles that we're concerned with, but again, these are just examples of pests that we are interested in and that we are, uh, we are concerned with. So I'm really just trying to emphasize that we are under threat. Our urban forest is always under threat, threat from pests and pathogens. In addition to that, we are also um, planting trees like crazy, which is great which is really great, but are we planting trees in the right place, in the right time? You know, as Ali has said, the, the right tree, right place is really important. And so what we're faced with is how do we balance more trees and how do we, um, how do we use the knowledge we have, but also how do we predict what's going to happen with future climates and what trees are going to be the best in those situations. Finally, we know that the environment is constantly in flux and that we're seeing some pretty unprecedented changes. And so together, what we have is a pretty messy mix of things that can lead to a tree becoming unhealthy. So we have more trade. We have 
the port of entry locally. We have more hosts being planted all the time. Could be potentially stressed hosts if we plant them in the wrong place. And we have more climate change or more changing climates to deal with. And all of this just equals more uncertainty, more issues, more problems. We need more support. We need more help. We need more people like you looking out for the health of our forests and keeping an eye on what's going on. So I'm going to highlight a couple issues that we're seeing or we're hearing about. We don't really have the answers. I encourage you to, to engage with me around this, ask questions about this. Our primary concern right now is western red cedar dieback, and I'll talk about this a little more. This is our primary concern because we know how important western red cedar is as a cultural resource. So throughout King County, throughout really from, from central Oregon all the way to central British Columbia, we're seeing this event where we see the top dieback of western red cedar. And we're really concerned because we know that red cedar is really important. We chose this as the first project and the focus of the Forest Health Watch because of the extreme cultural importance of Western Red Cedar. And, and this is really well illustrated with all these, these uh, images from the His Washington Historical Society, where you can see Western Red Cedar has been used for transport and shelter and textiles and clothing and all kinds of incredible art, um, carving some really just fascinating and, and important uses. It's considered a really generous species for all the gifts that it's given to indigenous cultures since time immemorial. And it's really important that we try and keep it on the landscape for future generations. In addition to that, Ali talked a lot about the urban forests in, in Seattle. Western red cedar composes 1,600 different trees on our streets in Seattle alone. So it's really important in terms of the footprint and the impact and what it's providing to us in Seattle locally. We're also concerned we're seeing heightened levels of red alder dieback. We're also really concerned with big leaf maple, and we've been scratching our heads about this for a long time. Recently, out of University of Washington, there was a study that linked it with longer and hotter droughts. So we have some resolution, some understanding of what's going on there. But we also recently have seen the emergence of a fungus that causes a disease called sooty bark disease. And so this is, was highlighted in the Seattle Times recently. Um, there's a really great article on the, the, the Washington DNR um, newsletter. But generally, we're quite concerned with this disease. It seems to be emerging more as trees experience the drought or the heat events, like Ali had mentioned. So this is kind of what we see. Um, it's characterized by this, this um, sooty fungal characteristic after the bark has shed. Or essentially, you see the bark flake off, and underneath, you'll see these black sooty patches. And that's kind of the characteristic that we look for with sooty bark disease. So if you do see this, um, we want to know about it, and I'll show you how you can share that with us. Another concern is the western hemlock, and this is our state tree. And it's kind of tragic when we think about what's happening with western hemlock. But again, this is an example of something we really don't have a good understanding of what's happening, why is this going on, and where is it happening. So in summary, there's a lot of different issues that we're concerned with that are affecting our trees and our urban environment. But we need more research and more community scientists, if you will, and more support for research to really understand what's going on. So this is kind of where the, the objective of the Forest Health Watch comes in. Well, there's a lot of issues. Ali mentioned, which is an incredible to, to hear from our standpoint, you know, we don't have a good understanding of how healthy our trees are in our urban environment. And so the Forest Health Watch, the premise is to, to empower people to, to look for and understand what's happening to their trees and also advance knowledge, but create shared understanding as well. And so there's a few different ways to engage with us. Um, you can sign up as a community scientist if you'd like to be in better touch with us. It's not at all required. Um, we also have office hours, virtual office hours every month. If you want to come and just ask questions, there's a time and a place that we're there. 
and you're always welcome to come and ask any question you want. Um, we, have, we also have office hours for tribal members, and we have office hours for um, how to use iNaturalist and, and some specific topics like that. And then finally, we have every month we do a, a research update. So if you want to hear what the community science data is showing and how are, we intend to use that, then, then these monthly updates are a really great opportunity to, to get that transparency and, and see what we're learning. So there's a lot of different ways to get involved with the Force Health Watch. Now I'm going to just share specifically how you can go away today and really help our urban forests. We use, um, we've created numerous projects on a smartphone application called iNaturalist. You don't have to use your smartphone. You can just use your computer if you prefer. But it's a really incredible platform that's open and free, and there's no ads or anything like that. Um, so check it out. We chose it because already 4 million people are using it, and they've already shared more than 65 million observations. So you can go on there and look at all the different um, organisms that have been shared in your neighborhood. It's a really cool tool, and it's really just built to accelerate science. The way it generally works is you share an observation, you take a picture of any organism, and you share it out, and the community helps you identify what that organism is. So you can use it as an identification tool, or you can share it with a specific project, like what we were asking. So as part of the Forest Health Watch, we have a bunch of different projects that you can engage with. Um, our primary interest right now is the red cedar dieback. So we've created a project to, um, to record where healthy and unhealthy red cedar trees are. And I'll get to that a little bit more. But we have a few different projects. One, there's a project that we recently created where if you think you saw sooty bark disease on a maple tree, you can share pictures on there and we'll, we'll, we'll be able to interact with you there. You're also welcome to just email me if you prefer. So again, coming back to Western Red Cedar and, and the priority project that we're asking for your help today. We, um, we created this project with help from the state and federal agencies. So there's, there's scientists um, here in Washington that are interested in tracking this. And we worked with them to extend that, that tracking capacity out to the public. And so today we're sitting at a little more than 1,200 observations. And what's really incredible is that we have an understanding of whether that each of these trees is healthy or unhealthy. So right now, if you went on iNaturalist and you search red cedar, you would find there's 13,000 red cedars shared on iNaturalist. However, we have no idea if it's a healthy red cedar or an unhealthy red cedar. And so that's why we ask you to specifically work with this project where you can answer a question about their health. If you're interested, you can see some preliminary analyses and play with the data and, and um, visualize it in a different way by going to forcehealth.org slash analyses. We're really grateful that we had um, a, a volunteer help us make this so that it updates every single day and you can go and interact and see look in your neighborhood and see where red cedars have been shared. Going back to why this is important and how this will help. So if we talk about all these different points that have been shared where we know um, that tree is healthy or that tree is unhealthy, now we can pull the GPS point from there and get a lot more information. So just from knowing if the tree's healthy and knowing where it is, we can pull in information like um, you know, what is the, the average temperature of that location for the past 30 years? What is the, the amount of rainfall that it's received this year? And so we can pull out some really neat climate data. We can also pull out some really cool topographic data, like where on the landscape is it? What direction is it facing? How much heat do you expect it to get in a given day? And then finally, we can also pull in what soils are there, what soil type is maybe influencing the health of that tree. And so really, just from sharing a, a, a photo of a red cedar and a GPS point of where that photo is taken and telling us if it's a healthy or unhealthy tree, we can really accelerate research and understanding about 
what are the factors affecting western red cedar dieback and where should we plant red cedar in the future or where should we not plant red cedar in the future i do want to emphasize that it's just as important to to tell us where healthy trees are as it is to tell us where unhealthy trees are and the last few slides I have are to talk about a couple of specific hypothesis tests that we invite you to participate in. So if you go to our website, you'll find uh, a little bar where you find hypothesis tests. And so we have, we have two that I'm going to share with you today. And this is building off the previous presentations, which is incredible. I'm just so grateful that I get to be a part of this. But let's say we hypothesize that red cedar trees will be less healthy in areas with hotter surface temperatures. And fortunately, because of King County, we have that information and that data. We know where hot areas are, and we know where cooler areas are. And so we, we've taken these maps, and then we've asked cities, eight different cities in this area in King County, to provide street tree data. And with that, we were able to pick out randomly some red cedar trees from these cities at different temperatures. And so now, the quest is, will you join us to go to these target trees on our streets and use iNaturalist to document if it's healthy or not? And together we can test this hypothesis to understand how is heat affecting our trees. So to learn more about that, you can go to forcehealth.org slash redhot. And we also have another hypothesis related to um, redlining and the historical practices in the city, where again, we hypothesize that trees in redlined areas will be less healthy than trees in non-redlined areas. And this is primarily because we know they're hotter, right? But you can help test this question. What does it mean if a tree is healthier in your neighborhood than a redlined area? What does it, is it a symbol? Does the health of that red cedar mean anything? If there's an unhealthy red cedar in your neighborhood, does that mean anything? So we're really interested in exploring how red cedar can be a symbol for the inequities in our, in our environment, in our communities, but also um, you know, how can we better, where, where are the areas that need more support in terms of tree health? So I encourage you to go to foresthealth.org slash Seattle you can um, just open this link with your smartphone, and it will open in Google Maps if you have Google, and you can navigate directly to the tree, and then you just share it on iNaturalist. It's pretty simple. And because of some really incredible donations from the Seattle Aquarium right now, whoever visits the most of these trees in November gets these four tickets, thanks to the Seattle Aquarium. And right now, there's only six trees that have been visited, so you really just have to like add more than two. <laughs> so please, yeah, I encourage you. Um, we need to get rid of these tickets. We're really grateful to have support and community partners like that. But in the end, you know, really this is a cool way that we can all work together to advance knowledge about tree health in our community. And it's a great way that we can all learn together and create this shared understanding about the factors affecting our trees and how we can keep trees healthy. So my, web, my email is holby at wsu.edu. You can also engage with me at the forcehealth.org webpage. And please don't leave tonight without taking some stickers from our project. Um, there's, we put some in the CCA. And I do want to invite, if you have feedback outside of this and you'd like to share your perspective or your thoughts on this presentation or our or our efforts at the Forest Health Watch, please, I invite you to share anonymously on forcehealth.org. The last thing I'll say is just extreme thank you to Marion and Sean for hosting us and the CCA volunteers. This is really incredible, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you're all here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joey. That was great. Lots of great opportunities for folks to get involved, and I really do appreciate that. So. Uh, now is the fun part. Well, this was all fun, but now the extreme fun part is your opportunity to ask questions of our panelists. I'm going to invite our panelists to come up front and uh, take some seats in the hot seats up here. Um, I would encourage you once again to write your questions down on those note cards. Volunteers are circulating around. They'll wave their hands in the air, and you can go ahead and take 
Uh, they'll take your, your cards, or you can go to Slido, type in the code, that's 568403, or you can scan that QR code, and uh, you can go ahead and submit your questions. We'll be taking those questions up front. Actually, uh, Joey, would you mind coming over here? It would be better for the... That's my seat, Joey. My seat. All right. So, uh, yeah, like I said, if you have questions for our panelists, I would strongly encourage you to get those to our volunteers or to submit them online. I'm going to go ahead and just start with the questions we've received so far. And so the first one that I wanted to mention, or the first one I wanted to bring up, was a question for, uh, this one's a question for Laura. Laura, so you mentioned the idea of sort of comprehensive planning for dealing with climate impacts, specifically uh, heat impacts. And I'm just wondering, in terms of the county's prioritization on how we deal with these things, you know, we've, we talked a little bit about urban greening, but is there a sort of a priority, sort of a hierarchy of things that the county is doing right now to deal with heat impacts? So I think the Seattle, the Public Health Seattle King County has done an amazing job of developing outreach materials that are in language uh, that really help different communities understand what their options are for managing heat when it happens. So I think that we are building from a good foundation of emergency management measures, but with climate change, we don't want to rely on emergency management measures as our way of responding. So it's not about like leaving those behind, but rather looking at how can we continue to build on those, but then how can we also strategically kind of continue to look at some of the other types of things that we should be doing, both in the near term, the intermediate term, and the longer term to adapt that built environment and our systems to be able to handle the heat. So. You know, we, did, we haven't prioritized these things to say this one's more important than that one. I think as we develop this strategy, we'll have some conversations around which actions are certainly the ones we want to move on sooner. Those may be actions like tree planting, which take time to for those trees to reach the maturity and to start providing the shade benefits. So let's great, let's get going on that, or let's keep moving and investing on that and accelerating and amplifying that. But then. There are other things that we'll want to be doing in the meantime while Allie's like planting all these trees and making sure that they're healthy and happy. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Actually, the, the, as you mentioned, Allie's making sure the trees are healthy and happy. And I guess the next question I had was one that I saw here was, uh, what is the city of Seattle, what is uh, Trees for Seattle doing to sort of be thinking forward into the future, what we might expect from climate change and in, in using that information in making decisions about tree planting right now? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I'm, you know, I think right now we, in our program, we are applying for additional funding for, you know, um, targeting communities um, that have low canopy and making sure that our Trees for Neighborhoods program uh, is working in language and, and really um, making, like reducing barriers to to tree care and to tree planting. And I think that we need to acknowledge that it costs money to water a tree. It costs kind of a lot of money to water it for the first five years a lot of times. Um, it isn't inexpensive. Mulch costs money, you know, all these pieces. And then they also cost time, and time we know to be quite expensive. And so I think that there are some ways that um, we are trying to look at, at our programs and say, like, you know, who's doing this well? I'm actually having a conversation um, with the city of Atlanta um, later, later this month, looking at other cities and saying, like, all right, what are your programs? How are you addressing this um, when it comes to caring for trees on private land for people who maybe they have access issues, like physical access issues, they have different abilities, maybe they have financial access issues. And so like those are some of the places I think we're trying to be innovative. Seattle uh, often prides itself on being an innovative city and so I hope that we can really do that work. Um, 
we got a lot of action, I think, sometimes to like live into that title. But I do hope that we can make those um, make make some of those actions that help people um, care for trees in the long term. And then also we work we're working with scientists to um, really help select trees that make sense. And that's a hard one. Um, as someone personally, I, I, I came from the restoration world. I worked a lot um, in with only native plants. That's kind of what I know. And so it's been a, a, chan a transition for me to like work more with um, horticultural, horticultural varieties and working more with some of our ornamentals and some, some trees from around the world. Um, but I think we also need to think about where we're getting tree seeds and sourcing them from further south um, and things like that. So we're trying to kind of keep in mind all of those things. And I just want to acknowledge that a lot of what I do is planning and communication. And so, you know, hopefully as well, we do have uh, city staff that meet um, quite often, actually, just to talk about urban forestry. We have a great core team. I really appreciate all those people that I get to work with. Um, and, you know, um, I think that you know engagement and getting people like you all to to speak to elected officials and doing doing that work and thinking collaboratively long term like our solutions are going to come from each other as well and so just listening to our community. Great, thank you very much for that, Ali. So uh, the next question, and I want to go ahead and give one to, to Joey as well. So one of the things we think about when we think about like community science or citizen science projects is sort of uh, one sort of reoccurring issue is how do we create opportunities for participation among diverse groups of people? And I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, Forest Health Watch is thinking about that as, an, as opportunities for folks within diverse communities to get involved. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's actually a pretty honest challenge that we're faced with is, is you know, we're doing this research to help communities, frontline communities that are, that are feeling the heat, literally, more than others, but are we doing a good job of engaging those communities? And to be honest, I would say we're, we got a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity to do better. We need to do a lot better in that regard. Um, but that's essentially the whole reason we want to do this as a community science project. We could be out there collecting the information on our own and, and publishing a paper to say, you know, trees are less healthy in redlined areas, but who learns from that? And, and that's kind of the whole premise of why we want to engage communities in this research as well. But yeah, can we do a better job engaging those frontline communities? Absolutely. And if I had um, great, ad you know, if I had advice for how you do that, um, I'd love to share it, but I'm still learning, I guess. And, and I would welcome any of you that have perspectives or input or insight on how to do that or relationships that you think would be um, interested or, or as Sean introduced at the beginning, you know, I'm always looking for more community partners and things like that. So if there's a way that we can work together to really, really make this accessible in the communities that we're trying to help, then, then I'm all ears. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for that, Joey. Well, a, a common theme among some of the questions that we've received from the audience is sort of the um, the, the push and pull when it comes to sort of tree canopy issues and building and, and sort of the idea of uh, one question, I think the most popular question here is, you know, how can we drive discussions and municipal actions regarding canopy cover and equity when the dominant narrative sets up a false dichotomy between having trees and equitable housing and of course increased density. So anybody have any thoughts about that? I just want to acknowledge that like it is a false dichotomy like there isn't a choice that you have to make that's like either affordable housing or trees um, there are I there are studies uh, there are incredible people speaking on this I, I don't need to be the person speaking on this um, Vivek Shandas is someone who helped us with our urban heat study and I've seen like incredible plans that he is not an architect but you know has a wealth of information available and you know we were talking Laura was talking about Renton like there are places that are doing this we can do this well it is possible and it's just not currently happening and so I think that that's something you know here all the time and so like we need to um, 
like conversations like this, I think awareness is, is hugely important. Um, and then I think, you know, looking and listening to, um, there are many places that are tackling this. I mean, we also want to talk about, I, I also want to talk about, and this is actually the, the call I'm having with Atlanta, is like, how do you add canopy and not displace people, right? Because we know that that also adds value to home sites. And so, you know, there, right now there are solutions that are being, that are being tried. Um, there are cities we can look to. There, there is like a global network <laughs> of people doing this work. Um, and so I think that we, when we look for solutions and we're willing to do things again, live into our innovative name, I think there are ways that we can, we can do that work. Um, I'll let you, I mean, you have, you had some good examples though, I think. Do you want to share a little bit more about the Renton spot? I, I guess I'll just, I mentioned that Willowcrest, it's an affordable housing development down in, um, in Renton, and it's currently under construction. I think it's almost done. Uh, so there's some good information available, but what's neat about that project is that it's designed almost like a campus. So it's the affordable housing, but as I mentioned, it's also the green space and the trees. And I think it's just this question of we can have trees, we can have affordable housing, we can have density. It's just a matter of, of how the choices that we make. And, you know, this is not, this is a, a solvable problem, right? We just, we just have to do it. I also just want to acknowledge, like, as a white person and as a person who feels, like, pretty comfortable in my city job, like, it also is a redistribution of resources, and we need to look carefully at where we are, we are diverting resources, and I think that that's something that, you know, I see happening a lot um, in my program, and so I hope it can continue, and really making sure that we are putting resources where they're needed the most. Thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to just add to this that it's, you know, I, I like to think of urban forests as an experiment. We live just in a giant experiment. And so we got to try things and we got to see what works in the, the, next, the near future and then plan for, for a greater future. But, but we got to try things and, and the more important part of that is we got to record and share out what we're doing and what works and what doesn't work. And we need to, that's where community science is really powerful is that we could design an experiment and look at you know, what trees are best suited for high density, what trees, I mean, the city has some of this data, but that's why we're here as a, as a researcher. I would love to, to work with, I mean, I'm clearly working with Ali and Lara, but I would love to work more with you all to, to design tests like that and do experiments and, and, and really try and advance knowledge in, a, in the urban forest that we live in, the big experiment that we all are experiencing every day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you each for that. So oh, another common theme here has to do with single family zoning and the fact that, as you say, Ali, a lot of these trees are, are uh, on private property. They're, they're surrounding, they're in the yards of single family homes. I'm just kind of curious what the city of Seattle is doing to uh, work with homeowners to maintain that tree canopy on private property. What, what is the the process, knowing, of course, the importance of it, not just to the, the homeowner, but also to the broader community. Yeah, and I, I know that I've seen a, cu a few tips of the hat in my direction already tonight on this, so I will acknowledge that I, I don't work for SCCI, and I'm not working on our policy. So I know this, some of you are, do know that there is policy that's been in development, and there's a lot to say about some of the the, the workings of that, and um, I'll have to be honest with you that I'm, yeah, we can have a conversation, and I have information about that to some degree, but I don't really have much information more than any of you. So a lot of you are really well researched in that, and I just will let that be. But I want to acknowledge that something that is really dear to my heart, and uh, you know, is how do we help homeowners that have trees and there's ivy crawling up the tree and suffocating it and they don't have the physical ability to go and remove it. You know, we have programs in the city that adopt streets, we have programs in the city that adopt drains, and so, you know, there's some, some pieces there that I think that we could work collaboratively, like, are there people in your neighborhood who need some support? Like, 
sure, I can, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm thinking about designing a volunteer program around that, but if, I, you know, it takes me a little while. If any of you want to, you know, start that work yourselves, that'd be awesome. Um, but I think that some of the questions that I have is like, how can we help each other? How can we come together to do some of that support? Um, and I think that that also, you know, if we, if we do it in these hyper-local communities, then we're, you know, we can work with community organizations, aka partner with them, aka provide them funding to help organize these kind of events where people actually receive support in their yard. Um, some of you know about the RainWise program. We have an actually a natural yard care program, by the way, through SPU. So some of these things are happening, and, and we just haven't transitioned it yet to trees. And so that's something that we're working on right now. Is like, how can, can we do this? How can we do this? How can we do this uh, legally with <laughs> all sorts of rules about private property? How can we do it in a way that's safe and healthy? And then how can we do it in a way that's equitable? Um, and so it's it's a great question. It's something that we, um, I, I, you know, I, that was like my last slide, which is like preserving canopy, large canopy that exists is, you know, that is mitigating climate. And so like that is, that should be our focus. And then how do we move out from there as well? And so of course, tree planting is fantastic, um, but you know, also preserving canopy is really important. And honestly, tree health and keeping trees healthy is kind of the start to that. Um, and also I just wanna acknowledge that there are times when we are too late. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, if some of you know about birches and what's going on with them. And so then also, how can we have programs within the city where we're thinking creatively and like, all right, we're going to have to have replacements for people when their birch tree dies. And we want it to have some of the same, um, you know, ecosystem services and mental health benefits and all the things that their, their previous tree has. And sorry if that was a bad news for you and you didn't know about birch dieback, but look at the crown of the tree on like any birch that you see in the city and most of them have um, fallen prey to some birch borer, which is an insect. Um, so, you know, just, just try to think innovatively and, and also prepare for some of these pests that are, are likely to, to change the canopy of this grand experiment, like Joey said. Thank you for that, Allie. Uh, Joey, you mentioned, you know, you, you, you rightfully sort of uh, provided a, a, a land acknowledgement during your presentation thinking about the land that we're on and thinking about sort of uh, the, the peoples that have been here for you know, time immemorial uh, stewarding the land. And I'm wondering if any of you in your work are working with uh, tribes, in, tribal governments, tribal uh, people in, in, uh, in collaborative ways uh, to uh, think about uh, traditional knowledge or ecological knowledge that could be incorporated into some of this uh, stewardship of these uh, trees, especially the native trees. Anyone want to speak to that? Yeah, it's a good question, and, and it's something that um, it's something we are doing. We, you know, working with red cedar has been a really, really another reason I'm really like a, a humbling way to recognize how privileged I am, but. Just to have the honor to, to connect with someone around a certain tree that's so important has been a really neat bridge to build relationships. And we're really grateful that we have this, this focus on red cedar. And we've been fortunate to, to learn a lot from tribal community members. And, and I'm, um, I feel like red cedar has kind of changed me in a really good way because I've learned so much just working with this species. And you're, so the, the short answer is, yeah, we have some, some um, growing relationships with tribal members and tribal communities. But um, you know, every day I think about how I should be sending another email or reaching out to another. We're really privileged in the, the Northwest that, we, that there's so many different communities. And there's, there's a lot of different tribes that I should be speaking to about this issue. And, we're, and so there's clearly a lot more work to be done. And, um, but yeah, in terms of how indigenous knowledge improve, could be useful and improve the work that we're doing especially, you know, just knowing whether there's been an event in the past similarly where we saw a lot of dieback of red cedar would be really, really valuable. And we don't have that knowledge yet unless we reach out to these tribal elders and we talk about these tribal stories and this indigenous knowledge. And that, you know, you, accessing that knowledge, you have to earn it. And I'm not sure I've earned it. And so that's where I am right now. I feel like I've got a lot of learning to do still. 
Yeah, I, I want to say that, you know, kind of Ali, the human who's not Teresa for Seattle, Ali, has, has benefited from many kind of deep and incredibly meaningful and like mind changing ex um, relationships um, with Native tribes and Native people and, um, and books and, you know, Robin Wall Kemmerer, I'm sure, sure some of you are familiar with Dr. Kemmerer's work, um, and getting to have conversation, I got to have a conversation with her before, and I feel like I've benefited quite, quite a bit, and so um, I want to acknowledge that this land has been, like Joey said, been cared for, like we're just continuing a legacy of care, um, and you are, and whenever you care for land, whenever you plant food, whenever <laughs> you eat, um, even old Himalayan blackberry, um, you know, our, our, but some of our, our native berries, like we are continuing a legacy of relationship and reciprocity with plants. Um, and so absolutely, Trees for Seattle, we have been, you know, making some conversations and connections with specifically the Duwamish peoples. Um, I get so, I live actually not super far from Heron's Nest and uh, the Longhouse and have spent some time there. I've worked as well in a Pacific lowland bog and so worked a lot with the Muckleshoot and other tribes. Um, but I just want to say, like, for me, when I answer this question, I just want to follow. I want to follow the, there are, you know, well-trod footsteps that I'm following in. And so I, I hope that I can con continue to do that. And there's some friends in this crowd who can hold me accountable to that as a human. Um, but also just really, uh, I too, I'm a big, I actually am a scientist who is a lot of woo-woo and I have a really great relationship with Western Red Cedar personally. I love that plant so much. Um, and it's always incredible when I get those chances to meet other people who, who have that understanding of those personal relationships with the land and with plants. Um, and so I just really want to acknowledge that that, that frame um, came from, from, for me, from my relationships with some of, um, and, and cats, um, <laughs> there's a cat up here if you don't know, it's really adorable, um, from some of my relationships with, um, with, with tribal members. You know, I'll just note the county is a huge organization, the counties and the county itself is huge. I mean, it's 2,200 square miles, covers a rich diversity of ecosystems, and we as a county government are involved in many aspects of helping to restore that, whether we're talking about forests, salmon, near shore habitat, um, any variety of other things, you know, dealing with invasive species, and all the way we're working with tribes either through formal consultation or at the, with technical staff. And so it's a complex answer to that question you know, in terms of how we're working with them on in our Three Million Trees Initiative, for example, or some of the other work, probably a question that's best directed to the staff working on that. Um, but yeah, but it's, it is something that's ever present in all of our work and relationships that are, we're always working to maintain with the respect that those relationships deserve. Yeah, interesting. Thank you very much for that. Well, we have one question. This is maybe the last question that I'll throw out here because I think it's, I mean, it's, it's great when we're called out in the Q&A, but given all the talk of equity, why is the panel and moderator all white? So I'm, I'm really, I mean, I, I know why I'm white, but I want to know what each one of our, from your perspective as someone who works with the county, someone who works with the city, someone who works with, with in research and with the university, how do we center these other voices, the voices of people who are truly impacted by these issues, these, these equity issues. What what are these? What are your organizations doing to try and center these voices? I think, like for this kind of event, we don't have it in Ballard. We would have it in White yes. Center, in South King County, so those communities don't have to drive a long way to participate. Um, so, as part of our strategic climate action plan, I had an amazing colleague, Jamie Strobel, who worked with frontline communities through the Climate Equity and Community Task Force. And those 22 amazing organizations developed an entire section of our strategic climate action plan on sustainable and resilient frontline communities. And we are continuing to work with that task force and continuing to do 
everything that we can to ensure that equity is embedded in our climate work and that equity is also, um, you know, frankly, just embedded in all the work of the county. I mean, the county's got a big focus on that. That's not just, not just us. But it is something that we have to work on. We have to both in terms of the system within we work, within which we work, but also with ourselves as individuals and with our communities so that we can do that work better. But um, yeah, I think to have, we talked about this and, and just, you know, just so you all know, in our planning for this, we did raise this issue and we talked about it very briefly by email, like, hey, it's an all white panel, right? You know, and I think acknowledging the equity implications of our work, I mean, that's an issue that's never been talked about that wasn't talked about before. Now we're talking about it, but we also need to be looking at who's talking about it and and who's speaking to these issues. And so, I, yeah, I, I, we need to get those voices here. We need to pay for those voices to be here. It's their time. It's their lived experience. They need, they need to be compensated for that because this is not their full-time job. And we need to go to where those communities are. Um, I just want to acknowledge that there is, you know, there's gatekeeping that exists um, in the environmental movement. And I just, you know, in my personal position, there, I'm a certified arborist. It takes three years of training. You can get paid through that. You can get paid. Yes, yes, yes. Jobs do count. But you have to take three years of training to just sit for the arborist exam. And, are, you know, the certified arborists are always asking, like, oh, well, what's our problem? And it's like, well, we, that, to get to this place takes so much privilege to be able to take jobs getting paid a, not a livable wage. Um, and it takes a lot of perseverance. It takes a lot of things. We know that that is there. Like, the character is there. It's the privilege that it takes to be able to sit for that test which, by the way, my job requires. And, and, and I, you know, I don't know that it shouldn't require it. It's just like that is, that is what it is right now. I also want to acknowledge that you know, we at Green Seattle and at Trees for Seattle, we're working with a lot of job training programs because restoration is very white. And, and urban forestry is very white. And so we need to find ways to hire, like Laura said, pay people to get training into these places and we also need to make places safe so that people feel like they can be there and so it takes a lot of work for white people especially to train themselves to educate themselves to look deeply on how we can make places safe for people of color to feel like they can they can be in that job and they can they can envision themselves there um, i think that's really really important as well um, and you know i think the other piece of that is um I've gotten to hire people and like we are in a place where it is changing <laughs> and you know we're like this is this is where we are right now is that a lot of these these qualifications that are required for certain positions aren't met by by people that we would like to be in the positions I think is the best way I could say that um, that there's not a lot of diversity um, and I think that's changing and I but I also want to acknowledge, like, and sorry to call it toxic academia, but like, we need to make spaces safe so that people can do a job, work their 40 hours, and go home and be okay, or be a graduate student and feel safe and like not be incredibly like overworked. And you know, there's just a lot of, of work we can do to really like dismantle toxic white culture so that people feel like. This is a place that they can be represented. And, um, and then also, of course, here I am talking on a mic. And so we can give up our mics and give them to other people as white people. Yeah, thanks to whoever asked this question. I think it's a, r a really good real discussion that we should all be having more often and all the time. And I'm, I'm honored that I get to stand up here with a microphone and, and share my thoughts on it. I'm clearly not the right person to ask this question to or to, to answer on how we increase diversity in our system. Um, again, just echoing that our voices are the wrong voices in a lot of cases. And for me, when I think of 
how do we be more inclusive? There's, there's two approaches. One is removing barriers. And, and as like Laura mentioned, you know, compensating people for their time, not asking the one person of color in your community to chair the, the, the equity committee and, and being the voice for equity because it's a burden in itself. But the other approach is relationships. For me, I just have realized that if I want to be inclusive, it's not about just opening my door and having a community office hours for tribal members. No one comes to those unless they have a relationship with me. And I have to go out that door and make those relationships. And that's, that's really my challenge. And that's what I challenge you all to do. And that's something that we should all be doing better if we want to really make impacts in our communities. Can I say just yeah. one thing? And this is something I usually have a slide on, and I apologize that I didn't put it in there. But um, Google exit polling and Google what communities, um, especially um, we're talking about race, what communities are most uh, concerned with climate change? And I want to say there's also work that we as white people can do to talk to other white people because that is, you know, we look at, it at people of color specifically. They're, they're, usually like, they're usually calling out Hispanic, Latinx, identified people and then black people and then white people and actually white people often score the lowest on being concerned about climate change like in this country so hey i'm just calling out myself like there's work that we can do talking to our parents talking to our neighbors talking to each other so i think there's also some work that we as white people can do to um you know address climate specifically um, and climate concerns with each other thank you for that so this is the last question because I know we're running out of time, and this is a really important one. Joey, I'll leave it to you first. What kind of tree are you? <laughs> that is a difficult question. Um, I've been asked similar questions like, what tree is your favorite? And that's a little easier. Uh, I used to think Vendrone was my favorite, but now I love red cedar, because the more I learn about it, the more I more I love it, but you should ask my partner what tree I am. I don't really well, that sounds know. like a real relationship <laughs> test, actually. <laughs> Maybe like a ponderosa pine or something. Like All right, very I can thick, see that. Thick-headed, if you will. All right, how about you? I'm gonna go with cascara because I just really love wetlands. So if you don't know about cascara, look it up. It's a great native tree. It's beautiful. I'm just going with that. I honestly have absolutely no idea how to answer this question. Um, but the one thing that comes to mind, I guess, like professionally, I'm working on climate adaptation, right? And that's about like being able to bend and move and, you know, and not get knocked down. And I know there are a lot of amazing trees out there that can really like take the hits, right? And, and come back up. But the only one I can think of is a weeping willow. I don't know why, like, you know, something that can really blow in the wind and 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 just kind of adapt and and keep on going so i don't know maybe maybe you guys can help me which is like a better northwest kind of a tree that can handle the wind and it's very resilient definitely not definitely yeah. limber pine limber okay i'll be in limber. limber pine all right all right well with that let's go ahead and give a big round of applause for our panelists thank you so much for each of you for giving us a great presentation but also